I don't like the agendas of other people in the mm -hmm. room. I really only want to hear if Quentin doesn't like something. And if that requires that or requires anything to be able to continue, you have to continue and pers persevere. One, one similarity I see between all the directors I've worked with that are uh, highly successful is that they all make their companies families. And it's extremely vital to make the people you work with invest their own love into, into their creative world. So if there's anything I would say is that when you go about trying to create in the future, build a family with your crew and with your actors. Mm. It's the very best to do it. And it when you breed love into those that work with you, you'll get the very best out of it. But what it is is your relationship with these people are the ones that are teaching. You know, I let them teach me. I push, but I also listen. You know, I have a I'm very demanding in terms of what I want to achieve, but I also have a high level of reliance upon their skills. And I think we all need to talk more about this is how vital a crew is to the support like, of me. My crew supports me and they help me achieve better goals. If I don't call out a T12 or whatever the light is, you know, he might put a 20 or he might do this or he might do that. And I'm only saying I want this quality of light. I'm gonna let him. And if he feels there's a better place for it and he says, I think it'd be better over here, I'm listening to that. If Gregor Tavener says to me and my first assistant, we should go with the E on this, the E series lenses. And each lens has a different characteristic. Gregor has a, a better sense of what each lens is than I do. So when we're setting up a shot, you go, well, this one's a little better with the wide. I think we should work with this. And I would go, okay, if we've got more clarity in the width, let's go with that. We, a relationship is built on trust. And I think that's extraordinarily vital. It's the same way I'm there to make Quentin's life easier. You know, if he requests something which is complex, I don't look at him and say, no. I'm gonna look at him and say, we're gonna get that done. We'll figure out the way to do it. And my crew is the same way. What Quentin wants, we're gonna do. And that's true with any director I work with. I'm always gonna try to achieve what they have their mind set on. And with a director such as Quentin, who spent five years of his life basically writing this, he already sees the film. It's in his head. So the greatest compliment you get from Quentin is, it's exactly like I thought. Because many people are shooting and framing off of iPhones or whatever their, their methodology is. They're not looking through eyepieces. It's changing the way they compose. There's this entire change of language is gonna take more and more part, I think, in the future that is evident now. When I watch and work with people that operate, and they come in on second camera, and they don't want the eyepiece. They want the monitor. Mm -hmm. And I say, let's put the eyepiece back on. <laughs> Keep the monitor. Mm -hmm. You're so old-fashioned, Bob. I am old-fashioned. <laughs> but I do believe that the idea of what happens with the eyepiece is one eye closes, and the other eye is focused on what you're aiming at. If you have both eyes available to you, you're scanning a world. Mm -hmm. And it's very difficult to put your concentration into the very thing you're supposed to be shooting. And to be able to see in close contact what an actor is giving back to you. So for me, I understand when I'm down here and you want this, and with the digital world we've been given that access in a brand new way, which you couldn't really do in the film world as easily. So I, I think there are changes, and some of them are positive, some of them are negative. If you're operating remotely, it's a whole different thing because then you have a big monitor and you can sort of tunnel your vision into it. So the composition is getting lost to some extent with some and not with others. It's, it all depends. You know, it's, it's no, I don't think there's any magic bullet formula for like where it's going to go. I think it's only going to get better and more interesting and there's a lot more freedom with creativity with what we now have. We're able to shoot films on your iPhone and, you know, if you want or whatever phone you have, it's... it's I have a strong belief that the better the production designer is, the better our work will be because they help propel and help aid us in how we grade our scenes in terms of how we light our scenes, how they're actually able to be staged. And I was extraordinarily fortunate working with Barbara Ling on this particular film. She knew LA ex 
extremely well. She was there in the 60s. She captured it perfectly along with Quentin's memories. They just worked in perfect sync. And I do believe production designers are absolutely vital to cinematographers in the creation of great work. Hmm. Quentin comes in with shot lists. They're extraordinarily specific. I try to maneuver those shot lists in terms of what's best for light. Mm -hmm. But sometimes the light isn't going to agree with what he needs to accomplish with acting. And then you have to either accept or not accept. And within that, that sequence you're talking about, there are things that I didn't like about it. But overall, we moved together as a team collaborating. And he would allow. And in truth, I wouldn't ask Quinn. If he, he said, like, I want to shoot this way now. Generally, I would probably go, Okay, fine. Mm -hmm. But we worked out an agenda. Well, it's taken me it's taken me a few movies with him to not fight him about what you know, okay, it's it's better for us to go this way as opposed to that way. I, mm -hmm. I, I get it now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I I fought with him before about that shit. But to have a director who writes brilliantly, who directs brilliantly, and constructs a film brilliantly, you have to move in to their space. Comment se fait-il qu'une jeune femme comme vous on arrive à posséder un cinéma? And a generation now is growing where they very rarely go backwards in time to look at films. I mean, the new wave for us is in very different capacities, whether it's you know French New Wave, whatever, or whether it's you know Lindsay Anderson, whatever it might have been, or where come, you know, it's like I grew up in that world and constantly studied it. I see a lot of people now that ha have not seen, uh, they wouldn't even know a couple of your films and they've never seen Natural, they're never going to see Natural, it's like... Uh, but I, I think, <laughs> you know, I mean, if you're going to be a writer, you have to read. You have and to so, read, I mean, I think it's important. I mean, I know my kids know every movie. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't know whether it's my influence or whether they just were interested, but I mean, I think it's really valuable to, uh, you know, I mean, if, if you're going to communicate visually, you need to expose yourself to every visual medium, and whether it's painting right. or sculpture or other movies or whatever it happens to be, I think. And, and not only that, but it's also a means of communicating. I mean, the only way I communicate with directors is by referring either to other films or to paintings or to, you know, something visual that becomes our way of, of talking or communicating. Yeah, I don't know if I could be a filmmaker if I hadn't met uh, if I hadn't seen the work of Bertolucci, you know, or go back even deeper than that, you know, of course, we can go way back until you see Orson Welles and the things he was doing with cameras that we could never have imagined doing. All I'm trying to say is we should push harder to, to have people. Yeah. It's not who's responsible, but we need to bring people together to have a larger language and less of a dismissal of cinema as an art that should be followed through. I was shooting a shot. Uh, Tommy Lee Jones walking down. I was doing Natural Born Killers. And uh, as I made the pan to push them into uh, a corridor inside a prison, I ran into a, a cell. And the camera smashed up against my eye. And this golf ball of blood popped up. And, you know, I couldn't see. And I looked over, and Oliver was looking at me like, well, there goes our day. I turned to the doctor and I said, Lance it now. And they cut it, butterflied it, and we just kept shooting. What that taught me was that just continuing to give all you can, whenever you can, that's, that's an extreme example of what you have to do. But I think in our lives, we have to be devoted to the art at a very high level. And if that requires that or requires anything to be able to continue, you have to continue and pers persevere. It's the same way you choose this path of making movies. If you're going to commit to doing something, and if you have that fire, that large in your belly, then you're gonna, you're gonna destroy everything in its path to achieve the highest level all the time.